this is a guy named Jeffrey Winder. He is a Jehovah's Witness governing body member. He's about as high up in the Jehovah's Witness hierarchy as you get. Jeffrey Winder is about to give a talk on new light. I think the talk is how the light gets brighter or something. So let's give our attention, please, to Brother Jeffrey Winder, who will consider the theme, how does the light get brighter? While we listen to this talk from Jeffrey Winder, we're going to play some uh, Let's Go Pikachu on uh, the Switch. Just something to do while we listen to this. What they mean when they say how the light gets brighter, it's a reference to their new light doctrine. They claim that God is giving them new light, new information to go along with what they already knew. And while it is interesting to us how our understanding is clarified, What really touches our heart is why it's clarified. Turn with me, please, to the book of Amos, chapter 3. Okay, if you don't know what was happening at this moment in history when Amos was written, Amos is one of the 12 minor prophets, along with, like, Malachi and um, Jonah and, you know, Zechariah, Zephaniah, I believe, were also minor prophets, so on and so forth. Amos was one of those minor prophets. And the minor prophets really just talked about what was happening in that moment. You know, they have a bad harvest. Well, it's because God's displeased with you for blah, blah, blah. You want a good harvest? Well, next year he's going to give us a good harvest. That's the prophecy. Because we're going to blah, blah, blah. You know, and then they make it a self-fulfilling prophecy by doing aforementioned thing that they think will please God. That kind of thing. So that's what Amos was. He was a minor prophet, one of the twelve. And notice what Amos 3, 7 says. Of course, Jehovah's Witnesses love dissecting, Jeho- I'm sorry, dissecting everything in the Bible and applying it to modern day. They believe that the prophecies made had two meanings. The first meaning that they had was what was derived by the prophet in that moment. The second meaning that they had is derived from the governing body. They decide what it means. They twist it around and and change it until it seems to match what they believe. For the sovereign Lord Jehovah will not do a thing unless he has revealed his confidential matter to his servants, the prophets. Doesn't that convey Jehovah's confidence in us? Doesn't Doesn't it indicate his love, his loyalty? Jehovah is actively involved in teaching his people, preparing us for what lies ahead. He's providing us with the understanding that we need when we need it. By the by, Cade the Squirrel, I was happy Rittenhouse was deemed innocent because I figured he was young enough to be reformed. Evidently, I was wrong because he just got even worse. Oh, I knew he would get worse. Absolutely. He was already bad leading up to what happened in uh, Kenosha, Wisconsin, he was talking about how he wished he had his AR and stuff like that. Standing outside of a pharmacy, seeing black people walking down the street, he says he wished he had his AR on him and stuff. And Sure, okay, maybe that could be an edgy joke, I suppose. Ha ha ha. Except he actually did shoot and kill somebody with his AR shortly after that. You know, this is like a pattern of behavior a pattern of beliefs, and it's about as disturbing as it gets. He's providing us with the understanding that we need when we need it. And that is reassuring, isn't it? Because as we progress deeper into the time of the end, as Satan's hatred intensifies and his attacks increase, as we draw closer to the great tribulation and the destruction of Satan's wicked system of things, we can be confident that Jehovah God, our God, will continue to loyally provide us with the direction and the understanding that we need. This is such a joke, dude. Why doesn't God just tell you? Why, does, why is he playing these games? I don't get it. We will not be left without guidance, unsure where to go or what to do. We will not be left to stumble in the dark because Jehovah has said, the path of the righteous one is like the bright morning light that grows brighter and brighter until full daylight. Again, he was not talking about his method of communicating with the church. He was talking about how a righteous man lives, basically. 
Are people clapping for this? Wait, why are they clapping? Is the, is the talk over? So I think this is taking place at a big convention center right now. Like, uh, you know, a, a, a huge arena. Well, this, with these things in mind, I invite you to listen closely to the next two talks. The first will be presented by Brother David Splain and is entitled, Trust in the Merciful Judge of All the Earth. By means of an angel, Jehovah God told his dear friend Abraham that he was going to destroy the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. The angel said, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great. Okay. And their sin is very heavy. Uh, a lot of the time people get this story wrong. Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed because of their treatment of the poor. People think it was a sign of being gay or whatever. It wasn't because they were, you know, because they partook in gay activities. It had nothing to do with it. The gay activity thing didn't come until after the city was condemned to be destroyed. Abraham was troubled. By the way, this is another governing body member. Uh, Jeffrey Winder was the last one. The one before him who introduced him, I think that was Kenneth Cook, maybe. He was another governing body member, and this is David Splain. He's number three. There's also Samuel Hurd, Gage Flegel. How many am I up to now? Five, I think. That's five. God, I don't, I don't remember all of the others. Garrett Loesch is one. Um, Sanderson, I believe, is another. Anyway. He apparently wondered whether Jehovah had taken all of the factors into consideration before he made that decision to destroy the cities. Oh, yeah. He bargained with God, right? He said, what, well, if there's one righteous person in there, then you should let me save him, right? And God is like, all right, fine, I guess. Like, as if God didn't, like, already make up his mind about stuff. I thought he was never changing. So he asked, Will the judge of all the earth not do what is right? Well, we can understand why Abraham would ask that question. It was early days in his relationship with Jehovah God. He was God's name is not Jehovah. Just beginning to get acquainted with Jehovah. And we can hardly imagine him asking the same question later. This is painfully stupid. When he knew Jehovah much better. But have you ever asked a similar question? Maybe when you were just coming into the truth? You see how they do this? They call it the truth like that. That bothers me a lot, too. Uh, it's, um, it's a loaded term designed to get people to reframe their perspective on the religion. They use the truth as a phrase, a key phrase, and they also reframe it by referring to themselves as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, not a Jehovah's Witness, not a member of the religion Jehovah's Witnesses, but one of the people that Jehovah uses as a witness, one of Jehovah's Witnesses. That's how they frame it. I refuse to feed into it. I'm not going to call it the truth, and I'm not going to call them one of Jehovah's Witnesses either. They are a Jehovah's Witness. Have you ever asked, for example, will none of those who died in the flood get a resurrection? Even those who may never have heard of Noah? And what about Sodom and Gomorrah? Will everyone who died in Sodom and Gomorrah sleep an everlasting sleep? The women, the children, babies. Wow, this is interesting. Okay, go on. And was there not one redeemable Assyrian soldier? You know what? I'm going to make a guess here. Let me give you a uh, let me give you a guess. I bet I know what he's going to say. Was there not one redeemable, redeemable Assyrian soldier? What about the babies? Listen to the other governing body member, Stephen Lett, talk about this late June 2022. Now, if we think about it, we're not born as friends of God because we're born as sinful offspring of Adam. You can see where this is going, right? Actually, if you think about it, we're born as enemies of God. 
Sometimes you'll hear people say of a little baby, look at that little angel. But more accurate would be to say, look at that little enemy of God. I'm sorry? Babies are little enemies of God, apparently. And anyway, that's their position. So to answer the question, yes, babies and women and children are evil and enemies of God and are worthy of death, basically, until they join the religion of Jehovah's Witnesses. They're enemies of God, yes. In that band of 185,000 who died at the hand of Jehovah's angel, we don't have the answer to those questions. But we do know one thing. The merciful judge of all the earth will do what is right. What is right is not killing everybody, not slaughtering them terribly. Not committing genocide. That would be right. Wait a minute. Did I hear that right? We don't have the answer to, to those questions? I thought we did. <laughs> They're reversing light that was previously provided. Oh, I love it, dude. So not only are they providing new light, quote unquote, but now they're morphing the light to say, well, we just we don't know. They're they're stepping backwards. Love everything about it. From my point of view, that dude is extremely evil and untrustworthy. Right. I know all of them that we're listening to right now. Um, although I, I think that they are true believers, I, they're still absolutely evil in the things that they do. In the past, our publications have stated that there's no hope of a resurrection for those who died in the flood or those destroyed in Sodom and Gomorrah. But do we really know that? The men of Sodom and Gomorrah were certainly wicked, and they deserved to die for what they did. But did they know any better? How often did Lot and his family preach to them? And are we saying that if special pioneers had been assigned to Sodom, that they would have had no success whatsoever in preaching to the Sodomites, helping them to turn around and come to a knowledge of Jehovah? Dude, I love that Sodomite came to be known as, like, gay person, when it had nothing to do with being gay. That is not why the city was destroyed. Can we say dogmatically that not one Sodomite would have repented if Jehovah's requirements have been explained? And then... There's the Dude, I'm just walking around at random hitting the A button in this tunnel and I keep picking up items randomly like a nugget and stuff. That's awesome. Fascinating statement made by Jesus found at Matthew chapter 11. I'll give you a moment. Matthew chapter 11. And we're going to read verses 23 and 24. Matthew 11, 23 and 24, okay. This is interesting. Matthew 11, 23 and 24. And you, Capernaum, will you perhaps be exalted to heaven? Down to the grave you will come. Because, and notice this, if the powerful works that took place in you had taken place in Sodom, it would have remained until this very day. But I say to you, it will be more endurable for the land of Sodom on Judgment Day than for you. It would have remained until this very day. Jehovah's angel had told Abraham that if ten righteous men could be found in Sodom, the city would not be destroyed. So was Jesus saying that if he had preached and performed powerful works in Sodom, Ten righteous men would have been found, and the city would have been spared. It's also of interest uh, to consider Jehovah's words to unfaithful Judah in Ezekiel 16. Um, back then, Israel had split into two parts, Israel and Judah. Eventually, Judah would become known as Judea down the line. I think in the 600s, it would become known as Judea. So when he says uh, Judah was unfaithful, I thought that Judah complained about Israel being unfaithful. I think it kind of depends on which one you're reading, because Deuteronomy, I mean, which book? Deuteronomy was written by 
somebody who's obviously in the South, in Judah, because they had an anti-North bias, an anti-Israel bias. But some of the other sections of the Bible were written with an anti-South bias, anti-Judah. Jehovah said that the citizens of Sodom were more righteous than the inhabitants of Judah. So if Sodom is doomed, what about Judah? But what about the disciple Jude's statement that Sodom and Gomorrah would undergo the judicial punishment of everlasting fire? Well, that certainly will prove true of the cities and probably many of the inhabitants as well. But does it mean that there's no hope for any of them? Jesus' statement we just read would indicate that there is hope for some. We just can't be dogmatic. See, there's the new light. The answer to will they make it into the new system, we don't know. Will they be resurrected as one of the great crowd after Armageddon? We don't know. That's a pretty big claim. So God killed a bunch of people in Noah's flood and in Sodom and Gomorrah. And there were absolutely innocent people in those situations. Tony Morris was very, and not just Tony Morris, but others. Like, this is a position that the governing body's held for a long time. The governing body and Tony Morris have been very um, cutthroat about their position on whether or not certain people will make it into the new system, basically. And I guess he's saying now we just don't know. Interesting. But again, we can say that the merciful judge of all the earth will do what is right. Now let's talk. Yeah, he'll do what's right, but his right and your right are not always the same. Because they absolutely believe that God does some really, really psychotic stuff, some deeply wrong things, morally depraved shit. But it's acceptable because it's God, and God is the arbiter of what's right. So if God does the right, or if God does anything, then it's the right thing by definition. That's the way that they view this situation. So he says, we'll, we'll know one thing for sure. Whatever God does, it will be the right thing. Merciful judge of all the earth will do what is right. Now let's talk about the flood of Noah's day. You know, he doesn't sound very merciful to me. I find it so interesting they're using the word merciful here. In the past, we've said that any who died in the flood would not be resurrected. But does the Bible say that? Now, Noah's contemporaries certainly were wicked. Now, the Bible says that man's wickedness was great on the earth, and every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only bad all the time. So those living at that time were sinners. But did they all get a thorough witness? Were they all given an opportunity to join? Jehovah's Witnesses think that the end won't come until everybody had an opportunity to hear the word of God. Originally, that's what they thought when I was little. Obviously, they're giving us new light on this subject. So, No one his family must have been very busy building the ark. How much time did they have for preaching? And were they able to do seldom worked territory? Uh, we have found that people who live within 10 miles of Bethel have never heard of Jehovah's Witnesses. So can we guarantee that everyone living on earth uh, during that time knew of Noah and what he was doing? We I love it, dude. Jehovah's Witnesses have a system to preach, to, to hit every single door. They will always, or I'm sorry, they will eventually knock on every door in America. And they have knocked on every single door in America at one time or another. They print out territory maps, or this is how they did it when I was younger. I don't know. They probably use some technology now, like their app or something to track what they work. But they used to print out territory maps, like the entire district. Every kingdom hall is responsible for a specific area. And they split the areas up that they're responsible for. And the kingdom halls print out maps of the entire like different maps of everything of the entire district and each territory map is supposed to take about i don't know um 
like three, four weeks to work if somebody is working it like every single week with a normal car group. Once you finish this territory map, you turn it in and you get a new one. So by doing that, they guarantee they're going to work every single door. But people move, people die, people are born, you know. Can't guarantee that they're going to, that every single person in the world is going to be aware of Jehovah's Witnesses, so. Can't really that, say. That's what he means when he says seldom worked territory. You should be, like, you put the territory map that you just worked at the back of the pile and pull one from the front of the pile. And even if it's remote, you're supposed to go out there and work it anyway. That's seldom worked territory, though. That's really far, like, way out there. And can we say that if someone had been given an adequate opportunity, he still would have turned his back on Jehovah? We just can't say that. Now, of course, if Jehovah didn't bring them back, they wouldn't have any grounds for complaint. They've had life. And life is more than any of us deserves. Are you kidding me? We don't deserve life? Really? This is a mindset that, in my opinion, is deeply toxic. Why do you think that you don't deserve to live? As you know, when Adam and Eve sinned, Jehovah could have destroyed them right away, but instead, he gave them the opportunity to have sons and daughters. Yeah, that was God's mistake right there. Look, I'm just some guy, okay? I'm not the smartest dude on planet Earth. I don't have, like degrees in philosophy or any of that stuff. But I'm sitting here wondering personally why God allowed Adam and Eve to reproduce. Why did he do that? Why didn't he give them a vasectomy, you know, give Adam a vasectomy, move Adam and Eve to America where there isn't a tree that can kill them if they eat from it, and create a new breeding pair? In fact, put, put the new breeding pair in China. Why not? Apparently, the tree of life and of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and all that junk are in the Iraq area. Why not move them somewhere else? Why even put them in that area? And as a result, we were born. Yeah, it was God's fault. He did it. It's on him. For the record, the book of Genesis and all the stories in there, it's something called antiquity literature that's the latin term for it. it the greek term is uh, archaeology literature and it's a type of writing that is framed like historical narrative but the writers don't differentiate between fact myth and legend they just put information in there stories anecdotes whatever and the book of genesis is like a series of I don't, like a bunch, like 10, 12 different sets of stories, of books. And if you notice, some stories are told multiple times, some with more detail than others, some with less detail. Antiquity literature, that's what it is. It was never intended to be taken literally, ever. So the fact that you and I have drawn one breath is pure, undeserved kindness. No. We are alive and we deserve to live. Everybody deserves a life. Now, do they deserve anything beyond that? Well, some people are absolutely psychotic and don't, you know, we need to be protected from them for society's safety, obviously. But life is the most valuable thing in the universe, in my opinion. And encouraging everybody on planet earth to believe that they don't deserve a life every single person no matter what that's psychotic man i i cannot abide by that on jehovah's part now on the other hand for many years it was suggested that all those who the bible says were buried with their forefathers were going to have a resurrection a solomon was one of those the bible says of him then Solomon was laid to rest with his forefathers and was buried in the city of David, his father. Well, we reasoned that uh, those who were buried with their forefathers were in the common grave of mankind, and we know that the common grave of mankind is going to be emptied during the thousand-year reign of Christ. The common grave of mankind. So if you don't know their eschatology, what it's called, 
their beliefs about the end times. Jehovah's Witnesses think that there will be a period of time when the the end of the end comes. They believe that we're in the beginning of the end, or maybe the middle of the end. I thought that the end of the end meant the end. I didn't know that the end needed a beginning to be the end, but apparently they have a, a beginning of the end, a middle of the end, and the end of the end. So we're in the middle of the end, presumably, almost just like right before the end of the end. Uh, you think I'm being facetious. I'm not. The, these are terms that they really use. Anyway, um, their eschatology dictates that in the end of the end, there's going to be a seven-year period of tribulation, the Great Tribulation. And the first three and a half years are going to be significant. I don't remember how it's going to play out, but basically the United Nations is going to take control of everything and kill all religious people, attack religion in general, including Jehovah's Witnesses specifically. Uh, God is going to use the, the United Nations, a.k.a. the Great Beast, to take out his enemies, and then they're going to attack Jehovah's Witnesses. So at the end of the seven-year period, God's going to kill everybody who doesn't deserve to live. And anyone who dies in Armageddon, up to this point, I don't know if they've changed their belief in this or not in this, but up to this point, I thought that they believed that if you die in Armageddon, that's it. No more, like, you're gone. You have no chance. But there will be a, a resurrection of the righteous and the unrighteous after Armageddon. And the righteous and the unrighteous includes nearly everybody. It includes um, everyone except for, like, Hitler, for example, or Adam and Eve, because they already had their shot at perfection or at everlasting life, as they call it. Oh, they also don't believe that the people will have immortality. They believe it'll be everlasting life. They draw a distinction between the two, bizarrely. Anyway, that's their eschatology. That's what they believe about it. Those who were buried with their forefathers were in the common grave of mankind, and we know that the common grave of mankind is going to be emptied. Yeah, through the resurrection of the righteous and the unrighteous. That's what they think. There's a famous video of Stephen Lett, governing body member, talking about their end times belief, their eschatology, and when it when it's going to be here. This one is from uh, mid-March 2020. The spread of this disease is distressing, to be sure. Talking about uh, COVID, obviously. But we're really not uh, surprised to see the world in the grip of such pestilence, are we? He is so weird. Jesus made it clear at Luke 21, 11, that pestilence would be part of the sign of the last days. So I guess that means we're in the last days, right? And in Revelation chapter 6, the ride of the fourth horseman includes mention of deadly plague. So the events unfolding around us are making clear than ever, that we're living in the final part of the last days, undoubtedly the final part of the final part of the last days, shortly before the last day of the last days. Oh, you thought I was joking, didn't you? You thought I was being facetious when I said the last days of the last days, or the end of the end, or the beginning of the end. Nope. Dead serious. These people are a joke. During the thousand-year reign of Christ. Oh, yeah. And he also mentioned the thousand-year reign. So after there's a resurrection of the righteous and the unrighteous, there will be a uh, there will be a thousand-year reign of Jesus where Satan is removed from the world and everybody has an opportunity to make a choice. Do they want to go with God or do they want to do what they want to do? Basically, if you're gay, you have to overcome that desire in your heart or you won't you know, you'll die within like a hundred years, basically, is what they say. You won't make it a hundred years in the new system if you continue living in sin. So God will kill you, and then after the thousand years, that should be everybody who agreed to be righteous. They're going to release Satan back into the world to do one final test on mankind. Why? I don't, you got me. And finally, Satan will be taken out permanently for good. And everybody who makes it through... The Tribulation, Armageddon, 
the resurrection and the thousand year reign of Jesus, and then the final test of Satan coming around and committing all of his shenaniganery, you know. Anyone who makes it through all of that will have everlasting life, not to be confused with immortality. Immortality implies a level of, or a degree of incorruptibility. Everlasting life doesn't mean you're, you'll be incorruptible. It doesn't mean you can't be bad. It just means you'll live forever, and if you are bad, then you die, basically. You don't get that live forever benefit. But uh, we ask ourselves, when Bible writers said that someone was buried with his forefathers, were they really revealing what Jehovah's final judgment would be? Was Jehovah revealing to them, inspiring them to say how he was going to settle the case? Or were the Bible writers really saying that this is the way the person was buried? This is the manner of his burial. Remember, in Bible times, the way someone was buried was very important. Uh, Joseph and Jacob refused to be buried in Egypt. High priest Jehoiada was buried with the kings of Judah because of all the good things he had done. All right, the kings of Judah, the south, if you remember. Judah or Judea split off from uh, Israel and took some of the tribes of Israel with it. Like, I think the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin went to the south, I believe. The other ten tribes stayed north. I mean, you know, people all intermixed and moved around and whatever, so it wasn't like a hard and fast rule. By the by, what is going on with this Abra? Why can I not find an Abra to save my life? I don't know what's happening here. Why is Abra so difficult to find? And when a prophet said that a certain king was going to have the burial of a donkey, that wasn't good. Solomon was the second wisest man ever to walk the earth. Oh, my God. And who was the wisest? Jesus? Solomon wasn't wise. He was kind of a fool if the Bible, um, what do you call it? Like, if the Bible account is to be believed. The dude was handed a completely unified kingdom by King David, and he shattered it by being an obtuse jagoff. That's J-A-G-O-F-F. He shattered it into a billion pieces by trying to force his hand, by forcing people to comply to him. They didn't like that. That's not wisdom. That's idiocy. Jehovah appeared to him twice, and the second time he appeared to him, he said, If you and your sons turn away from following me and go and serve other gods and bow down to them, I will cut Israel off from the surface of the land. What? did Solomon do? Your mother. He began to serve other gods and bow down to them. Solomon did that? I'm sorry, I don't remember that part of the story. Maybe he's accurate. I just, yeah, I missed it. How will the judge of all the earth view that? That's not for us to say. Oh, interesting. So they're going with the old verse from Romans. What is it? Romans 7? I don't remember. Anyway, it says... Uh, God, only God will judge, basically, is, is what it says. Um, I love that they are now finally coming out and saying, we don't know. That is the accurate position to hold, according to the Bible. So we can't be dogmatic about the prospects of those who were said to be buried with their forefathers. It Jehovah's Witnesses not being dogmatic? Go on. It could be that the Bible was just indicating the manner of their burial. Now, that isn't to say that they won't be resurrected. It simply means that we don't know. Check it out. The enemy in this, the uh, trainer, is named Elijah. That's funny, based on what we're listening to, right? The righteous judge knows, and we know that he'll do the right thing. Again, the right thing is whatever the righteous judge does, because he defines what is right. Well, if that means killing everybody from here to Texas in a split second because he doesn't like the way they look at him, that's the right thing. Well, what do we know about Jehovah? Absolutely nothing, because Jehovah's fake. Why can we trust him to do the right thing? <laughs> oh, my God, dude. I'll look at the record. In the days of the prophet Joel, God's people were in a sick spiritual condition. 
They were- I love that he's now trying to appeal to people's morality and defining good and evil moral positions as like he's trying to uh, determine if what God did was moral rather than saying God is moral by definition, because that's what Jehovah's Witnesses believe. Anything God does is moral. Worshipping the Baals and the golden calves and sacred poles. They were lying, committing adultery, stealing, shedding innocent blood, oppressing widows and orphans. Jehovah had good reason to wipe the whole nation out. And yet what do we read at Joel 2.13? Joel says, Rip apart your hearts and not your garments, and return to Jehovah your God, for he is compassionate and merciful, slow to anger and abundant in loyal love. Are we talking about the same God? And he will reconsider the calamity. He will reconsider the calamity. After all that, Jehovah was willing to show mercy. Now this is very encouraging. Why? Many of our brothers have no trouble accepting the fact that Jehovah will forgive the sins they committed in their ignorance before they came to a knowledge of the truth. But if they've committed a sin after baptism, they're afraid that Jehovah will never forget and he will never forgive them. And yet what do we see here? The nation of Israel was in a dedicated situation before, uh, before Jehovah, and yet Jehovah said, if you stop doing what is wrong, if you start doing what is right, I will reconsider. Interesting. I find it uh, fascinating, in addition to all of this, that Jehovah's Witnesses also believe that people won't be married after they get into the new system. No one will be married. You're going to have to start fresh. If you get married to somebody now and that person dies and then you get remarried, when you get to the new system, marriage will be abolished no matter what. Even if you make it through with your spouse, marriage is null and void. And and that's been like the source of a lot of pain and, and grief and unhappiness. The fear that you wouldn't be married to your spouse anymore once you get there is, is serious, you know. It's a really big deal. Then you have the encouraging words found at Ezekiel 33. Let's read this. And I find that this is a good passage to read to uh, brothers and sisters who may feel that Jehovah could never forgive them for what they've done. Ezekiel 33. Dude, it's so sad to know that people are obsessed with the idea that God's going to, like, s- just burn them forever. Not burn them, but kill them permanently. They'll be gone forever. That's it. No chance of coming back or anything because of some little thing that they did. You know, they uh, they lied on their driver's license, said that they were 5'9 instead of 5'8. Or they said they have blue eyes instead of green or something like that. That is a sin. It's unforgivable. Lying is a disfellowshipping offense, and you will not make it into the new system if you do that. That's the kind of culture that they encourage. They want people to be freaked out and believe that they're right on the edge of losing everything at any given moment. Verses 14 and 16. Verse 14 first. And when I say to the wicked one... Dude, I'm seeing Abra's now, finally. You will surely die. And he turns away from his sin and does what is just and righteous. Verse 16, none of the sins he committed will be held against him. For doing what is just and righteous, he will surely keep living. Now, isn't that encouraging for someone who strayed from the truth, maybe got involved in some... Again, the truth just drives me insane. Encouraging for someone who strayed from the truth, maybe got involved in some bad conduct, and and far too many of these are afraid that Jehovah will never forgive them. They would love to come back to the truth. They would love to come back to Jehovah, but they're afraid that Jehovah is not going to accept them. And yet he says... None of the sins he committed will be held against him. The case of King Manasseh makes the point. Oh my God, dude. This is 
This is busting my nuts hard. He was in a dedicated relationship with Jehovah, and yet for most of his life, he did what was wrong. But when he repented, turned around, and started doing what was right, Jehovah wiped the slate clean. Heck! What a marvelous, merciful God we worship. It shows that Jehovah will show mercy whenever he sees a basis for doing so. Now consider how Jehovah dealt with the people of Nineveh in the days of Jonah. Their conduct was so bad that Jehovah... Dude, come on! Why can I not catch this damn Abra? This is killing me! Jonah, their conduct was so bad that Jehovah was determined to destroy the city. And, and Jonah was in agreement with that. Yeah, wipe them all out. <laughs> but Jehovah was more merciful than Jonah was. And when he saw that the people repented and turned around, he was willing to forgive them. Why? The Bible tells us why. They didn't know right from wrong. They did. So he's saying we, just, we don't know. He's justifying his position that he doesn't know. Great. Didn't know any better. Will some of those Ninevites be back? Jesus' words found at Matthew 12, 41 seem to indicate that they will. He said, men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and will condemn it because they repented at what Jonah preached. But look, something more than Jonah is here. So what do we see from these examples? The men of Nineveh, Manasseh, and others. They were wicked. They did bad things. They repented. They started to do what was right. And Jehovah wiped the slate clean. Well, today, power for judging has been given to someone else. There's a different judge. I guess it's Jesus it was given to? Judge of all the earth. Yeah, it's actually the Son of Man. The Son of Man is supposed to be the judge. And before becoming the judge, the cosmic judge, he has to take political control of Israel. That is one of the prerequisites. But he, d he never did that. Jesus didn't take control, so he's supposed to come back so that he can take control. Uh, that's why I find this so fascinating, their whole belief system. We read about him at uh, John chapter 5. John chapter 5, and we're going to read verse 22. I'll give you a moment. For the Father judges no one at all, but he has entrusted all the judging, all the judging to the Son. Well, lots of new light in this. I mean, this seems like it was just all new light, apparently. Jesus has been given authority to judge the living, and the dead. Well, can we trust him? Can we be sure? Well, can we trust him to do exactly what he wants to do, whether it's right or wrong? And can we trust that he, his actions are the definition of right and wrong? Well, sure, I suppose. Sure that Jesus will be merciful? Absolutely. He's the exact image of his father. And the prophet Isaiah wrote of him, he will not judge by what appears to his eyes nor reprove simply according to what his ears hear. He will judge the lowly with fairness, and with uprightness he will give reproof in behalf of the meek ones of the earth. Give reproof, okay. Reproof is a judicial action, quote-unquote. It's a punishment within Jehovah's Witness religion. You can be reproved for doing something wrong. It's when you commit a disfellowshipping offense, but it doesn't, uh, but they believe you're repentant and or it hasn't quite it hasn't done, been done enough to warrant a disfellowshipping. Like lying is a disfellowshipping offense. Watching boxing matches, disfellowshipping offense. But it's really only when it's habitual, like when you do it constantly, that's when it reaches the point of disfellowshipping. So that means that reproof can be used in those cases, and it means that you lose all privileges, quote-unquote, within the organization. Depending on how serious it is, they may take away your, your ability to knock on doors. They may not let you 
answer at the meetings, as they call it, in their question and answer section. Um, they may, you know, take away your ability to do labor for the organization, all kinds of things. So I'm not sure what he's talking about here with reproof. The authority that Jesus has been given includes the authority to resurrect the dead. He's the resurrection and the life. Now, you know, we often say that Jehovah God knows everything about those who have died, and that's true. But since Jesus is doing the resurrecting, it's reasonable to conclude that he also knows everything about the dead and the living, and he's going to be able to resurrect them accurately. Now, whether he'll share the power to resurrect with his anointed brothers when they're raised to heaven remains to be seen. Oh, I love it. So he believes that he's anointed. And as I talked about previously, anointed means you're one of the 144,000. You go straight to heaven when you die. You're given a heaven sword in Armageddon and sent to kill people that you didn't like. Wow, that ball went really far. So anyway, that's, that's what he's, he means when he says anointed. We'll stay tuned. Well, what's the takeaway from this talk so far? How would you explain it to someone who wasn't here today? You well, it seems like... He's saying they don't know. That's the bottom line. We don't know. Would not say, some in, who died in Sodom and Gomorrah and in the flood are going to be resurrected, and Solomon isn't going to be resurrected. No, 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 you wouldn't say that. <laughs> what we're saying is that we shouldn't be dogmatic about who will and who will not be resurrected. We just don't know. But we trust Jehovah God. We trust Jesus Christ that they will do what is right. This is, uh, it kills me every time he says this. I know what you're thinking. The wheels are turning. And you're saying to yourself, come on, come on. We've talked about the flood. We've talked about Sodom and Gomorrah. But what about the Great Tribulation? Is there anything that we can or can't say about that? No, that's a good question. So like I said previously, I'm not sure how long ago, so I'm going to reiterate a little bit. Like I said previously, the Great Tribulation is a period of time right at the end of the end. It's a seven-year period of time where religion is going to be attacked and the United Nations is going to be the attacker, basically. The Great Beast of Revelation is uh, the United Nations. So once the great beast attacks religion uh after seven years it wipes almost all of it out jehovah's witnesses are facing hard times until finally armageddon starts in full and that's when god kills everybody that that isn't supposed to be alive kills the great beast effectively so anyway yeah that's uh that's their belief in the tribulation and up to this point they believe that Anybody who dies in Armageddon, not in tribulation, but Armageddon, is gone. Once they enter the Great Tribulation period of time, you've lost your opportunity to join the religion and make it through Armageddon. You're, it's over. And their message is going to turn from one of good news to judgment, meaning when the Great Tribulation starts, they're not going to say, come join our religion anymore. It's closed. You can't join anymore. They're going to switch to your friend. They're going to continue knocking on doors. They're just going to start telling people, you're fucked. So anyway, that's the Great Tribulation in a nutshell. That's what they believed up to now. But I believe that this is, I mean, this is a new light talk. So they're about to change it. We should talk about that. You know what? I think my time is up. <laughs> wow, that's kind of messed up. Hold on. Sorry. I'm trying to catch this damn Abra. These things are like a nightmare to catch. There we go. Jesus Christ. Oh, this is killing me. So, uh, like I said before, the new light that they offered is you can join the Jehovah's Witnesses after you see the evidence, after you see the signs, and you'll be okay. Well, people who were previously Jehovah's Witnesses can rejoin the religion, to my knowledge. I don't know if that means like everybody can read or can join or they're, 
not going to switch from a message of good news to judgment? I don't know. But that's the new light. Anyway, let me know what you think about it in the comments. These people need help. Seriously, get help, people.